Good evening, I'm Gotti Schwartz. Great to have you back on Now Tonight. We're going to begin tonight with some breaking news. The man behind the loss of billions in cryptocurrency is now behind bars. We're going to have the details on the arrest of FTX's CEO, Sam Bankman Freed. A massive storm brewing. Millions are in the path right now of snow and severe weather. As the National Weather Service says, the heart of the country will be hit the hardest. We're going to tell you where this storm is heading right now. Then in custody, the U.S. authorities that say that they have a man accused of blowing up a passenger plane over Scotland back in 1988. How they found him nearly 34 years after the attack. And history in the making. Karen Bass sworn in as the first woman to serve as mayor here in Los Angeles. And she's got her work cut out for her. More on her plans to tackle the city's problem with homelessness head on. Plus, come on down. Legendary game show host Bob Barker celebrates a big birthday today. That plus a few more reasons to celebrate coming up in tonight's 60 Seconds of Joy. And we begin tonight with a winter storm that has crippled the western part of the country and is now heading east. The storm dumped as much as five feet of snow in California's Sierra Nevada mountains, shutting down Interstate 80 in both directions for about 70 miles because of whiteout conditions. The highway has since reopened. The heavy snow and ice also sending a bus sliding onto its side in Utah. Almost two dozen people hurt. Utah State Police say it happened early this morning when the bus driver was changing lanes and lost control. Meanwhile, avalanche warnings are in effect right now around Lake Tahoe throughout tonight, where wind gusts at some ski resorts are topping 160 miles an hour. While the heavy precipitation begins to dissipate in that part of the country, blizzard conditions are expected to inch their way across other parts of the country this week. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us now from Truckee, California. Hey, Miguel, I know that this storm seemed to hit the Sierra Nevadas harder than anywhere else. Uh, from the looks of it, a lot of snow on the ground. Yeah, Gotti, these are just epic conditions. As you mentioned earlier, we're talking about five or six feet of snow. We think it's at least that deep in this area. Take a look at this snow bank. This is just undisturbed snow over the last 24 hours, and it's already oh. waist high, and it's certainly I could go further down. We know that about five feet of snow fell across the Sierra in general. That was some serious, serious snow, but there was also howling winds up here. The wind speeds in this region hit 169 miles per hour. So we had those hurricane force winds, that blinding storm. It shut down I-80, which connects, as you know, California and northern Nevada. That's a major thoroughfare. Folks were stuck in their cars on the side of the road for hours. And down in the Bay Area at lower elevations, they had upwards of five inches of rain. We also know, Gotti, in Southern California, we even had a few inches of rain in that region. We had some flash flooding. And, of course, the big concern out this area was those avalanches. That remains a concern because of all the heavy snow on so many trees here. We know they're not out of the woods here. This storm is still on the move, Gotti. And, Miguel, over four feet of snow in such a short time. Do we know how much more uh, snow this storm is expected to bring? Well, we're fortunate here. We had 48 inches of snow in about 48 hours, but we think for the most part, at least this week, that the snow has passed this region. It's moving east. They're going to see several inches of snow in the Great Plains. They're talking about tornado warnings and blizzard warnings, possibly. Colorado is bracing for its first blizzard warning in about two years. So this storm is still very powerful. It is beginning to lose a little bit of steam after rolling through the Rockies here, but it's still on the move, and we're told Gotti it packs a serious punch. Clearly, from the looks of it. Thanks so much, Miguel. You bet, Gotti. Good to be with you. And these storms aren't just dumping snow in the West. We've got snow on the ground from California to New York, with the National Weather Service calling for more of the same this week, and even a small chance of a few tornadoes. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens has more. Hey, Bill. 
Well, good evening to you, Gotti. And this has been an impressive storm already. And I'd have to say we're only like through the first quarter. Like we still have to go through about four more days of this storm traveling across the country. And we're going to see significant impacts all along the way. But what happened already is just the impressive amounts of snow and rainfall. And it's a double edged sword because we've all heard the stories about all the droughts. The reservoirs in the west are only about a third full. So we need these big, powerful storms to dump a lot of snow that will then eventually melt and go into the reservoirs or a lot of the rain. But we don't want all the problems that come with them. And that's what we saw over the past weekend. So the storm currently is now traveling through the Intermountain West. All of the impacts on the West Coast are just about over with. Now we're going to watch the storm heading out into the plains, and that's when we're going to have significant issues. I think by far the highest snowfall total we're going to have with this storm system will be what happened in the Tahoe area. I mean, we saw some areas that picked up 35 inches in one day in 24 hours. That's impressive. In total for the weekend, Soda Springs had five feet of snow. Tahoe had about 46 inches. Even areas like Heavenly and Mammoth Mountain, every ski resort pretty much got at least two to three feet of powder over the weekend. Very impressive stuff. The high winds were also amazing, too, if you saw those. So we have 13 million people that that are either under winter weather advisories and white winter storm warnings and red and then that purple color that's when we go into blizzard warnings portions of five different states so really it's from casper out to valentine nebraska from the northeast corner of colorado northwards all the way up in the southern montana those are the areas that are going to have the most treacherous conditions and that's where we're concerned about drivers getting stuck if we get these snowfall rates and totals with one to two feet and then imagine what 60 mile per hour winds could do to one to two feet of snow. You're going to get huge snow drifts and it's going to be blinding snow too. So, uh, you know, like ground blizzard conditions. And so Interstate 80 uh, through Nebraska, Interstate 90 through South Dakota, Interstate 25 heading through Wyoming. Those are all the highways that will almost be impossible to travel at this time tomorrow and likely right into Wednesday. So I'm sure they're going to try to tell all the 18 wheelers to stay off those roads. We don't want people getting stranded. We don't have to do rescues. And you also worry about storms like this. You know, with livestock. Uh, they need food. And you worry about, we've had storms in the past like this where our entire herds have been stranded without food. And uh, obviously those impacts can be severe, if not life-threatening. So here's what we're going to watch tomorrow evening. So at the same time we're dealing with this blizzard, to the south, we're going to have a severe weather outbreak possible. 17 million people are either in the slight risk or the enhanced risk. The area of orange means you have a greater chance of a, a higher a frequency of seeing severe weather. That's either damaging winds or or tornadoes. So this includes a lot of big population centers from Dallas all the way to New Orleans. But it's that area in the middle that we're greatest concerned for strong tornadoes from Lufkin to Jasper all the way to Alexandria. This would be tomorrow evening. So nocturnal at night. And those are the ones that tend to be the deadliest. We still have flood watches that are up for this area too. So heavy rain along with that severe weather threat. And then we end this week with this storm redeveloping off the Delmarva. This looks like a nor'easter. Now when you hear the term nor'easter, everyone's like, uh oh, big snowstorm for everyone. Not quite. Nor'easters also can be warm enough to have rain, and this one will be a rain event for the coastal area. So from Boston to Providence, Hartford, New York, and Philly, it'll be mostly a rain event. Interior sections have the best chance of getting a heavy snow event, especially the mountains of New England. Skiers will love it, but anyone trying to travel on Friday, Gotti, the Northeast is going to be a mess. Thanks, Bill. And some breaking news tonight. The CEO of FTX has been arrested by Bahamian authorities tonight. A sealed indictment against Sam Bankman Freed has been shared by the Southern District of New York with the Bahamian government. Details in that indictment are expected to be revealed tomorrow. Now, FTX was the company at the center of that multi billion dollar crypto meltdown last month and one of the biggest exchanges in the crypto world. For more, let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalo. So, Danny, uh, this arrest seems to set the stage for Sam Bankman Freed's extradition back to the United States from the Bahamas. How long does that process usually take and, and what kind of charges could we see in this indictment? In the normal non high profile case, that answer is who knows? It depends on the country. It depends on that particular country like the Bahamas, their procedures how quickly their courts move for the extradition process. Uh, and then once you get the person back into the States, they may not go directly to the court prosecuting them. They may go to the closest available spot. And from there, the U.S. Marshals or whoever takes charge uh, takes normally takes their time getting the person to uh, the court where they, will, where they will face trial. But this is a high-profile case, and you can expect that to expedite matters somewhat. 
And Danny, I don't know about you, but every time I look up at his screen over the last few weeks, it seems as though uh, you see him talking. It's been staggering how many interviews SBF has been giving since that billion dollar meltdown. Uh, how much are prosecutors going to be looking at some of those public comments as they build their case? Oh, in the modern era, uh, defendants uh, routinely create evidence against themselves, whether it be text message, Instagram, and in the case of SPF, public statements on video. Plenty of transcripts are going around at DOJ. They're going to have plenty of evidence that they can use against him. In fact, arguably, uh, the reason that they might have decided to arrest could be that, hey, once he backed out of talking to Congress, they figured, well, this may be the end of his public statements. That's as good as it's going to get. We might as well arrest and move forward with this case. And Danny, while we've got you, there's another really important case making massive headlines today. A man accused of making a bomb that brought down a jetliner and killed 270 people 34 years ago was finally in court here in the United States. Let's take a quick look at the aftermath from all those decades ago. Pan Am Flight 103 from London's Heathrow to New York's Kennedy Airport was at 31,000 feet and just 52 minutes into its flight when air traffic controllers suddenly lost contact. A short time later, the 747 crashed into a Scottish village and exploded in a ball of flames. In a matter of seconds, the community was ripped by explosions and fires. An earthquake some residents thought at first, others believed a local factory had exploded. In one part of town, seven homes disappeared in flames. A gas station exploded. A fireball rose hundreds of feet into the air. Now, fast forward to today. The person suspected of making the bomb that blew up the passenger jet over Lockerbie, Scotland, some 34 years ago, was in an American courtroom. Now, that passenger jet exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland, and now prosecutors say it was a Libyan national named Abu Aguila Mohammed Massoud who made that bomb, now charged with a three-count indictment carrying potential sentences of up to life in prison. Two other Libyan men were already tried in the case, but Massoud is the first to appear in a in a, an American courtroom. Family members of that attack spoke out, spoke out today. And, and our hope is that we'll be able to uh, find out what he knows, and hopefully he'll be able to identify other co-conspirators so we can also bring them to justice. Now, on December 21st, 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 was traveling from London to New York when a large bomb exploded, killing all 259 people on board and 11 people on the ground. Danny Savalos, thanks for staying with us. Now, we don't know much about the arrest itself yet, uh, but Masood was charged with two criminal counts back in December of 2020. So why did it take so long for him to be charged and, and captured? We don't know yet, but I suspect once the story emerges, it will be because he was in a country like Libya that effectively put him out of reach of U.S. officials. And that happens from time to time, uh, that just because uh, the U.S. has charged someone, if the country that they're in doesn't have an extradition treaty or even a good relationship with the U.S., then they may not be able to extract that person or get them extradited back here to the States to face charges. Just by way of example, you may remember the Mueller report, the Mueller investigation. They charged individuals in Russia, but it was mostly symbolic because some countries like Russia, you cannot get people out of if you want to bring them here to the U.S. So it might be the case that this defendant made a mistake, went somewhere where he came within the jurisdiction, the extraterritorial jurisdiction or the reach of the U.S. or a country friendly to the U.S. that assisted. We may find out that that is how he finally got into custody. And Danny, there was also a former Libyan intelligence officer that was convicted on 270 counts of murder in connection to this case uh, back in 2001. He was given a life sentence, but that wasn't here in the United States, as I understand it. That was at a, a special court in the Netherlands. If convicted, what would sentencing look like here for Massoud? Had he been arrested or the crime occurred uh, in modern times, he would be eligible for the death penalty. But because at the time this crime was committed, these particular charges, the destruction of aircraft resulting in death and the other charge, did not call for the death penalty. So he gets the benefit of the maximum potential penalty at the time of the commission of the crime back in the 80s, as opposed to today, where in the federal system there is the death penalty, and he likely would have been eligible for the death penalty had those crimes been committed today. 
Danny, thanks so much. And the FBI is out with their annual hate crime report for the year 2021, and it is giving, getting a lot of attention for what is not included. In 2021, only 65 percent of police precincts reported hate crime data to the FBI. That is down from 93 percent from the year before. A new reporting system has likely led to fewer police departments contributing data, including from two of the biggest cities in the country, New York and Los Angeles. The data that was shared, however, reveals that race, race or ethnicity bias drove most hate crimes, followed by bias based on sexual orientation, religion, gender identity, and disability bias. NBC's Jacob Soboroff sat down with the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and talked about how to deal with targeted violence against marginalized groups. Jacob? Gotti, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was here in New York City today speaking to a gathering of Jewish leaders at an Orthodox synagogue on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. He was talking about an urgent threat that he knows all too well, anti-Semitism. Secretary Mayorkas is Cuban-American. He's also Jewish-American. His mother fled the Holocaust and he lost nine family members in that genocide. I asked him about one of his main goals that he stressed during his confirmation hearing, and that was to eradicate anti-Semitism two years ago. When he went before the Senate, here's what he said. Nearly two years ago at your confirmation hearing, you said that you had wanted to tackle the issue of anti-Semitism once and for all. But what I hear you saying today is it's only gotten worse. I think that's, that's absolutely right. But our fight has only become more fervent. The resources we have invested in it have become greater. Our dedication uh, to uh, addressing targeted violence against any group uh, has become more and more intense. Unfortunately, Jacob, as you correctly note, uh, the need for it has increased as well. Secretary Mayorkas Gotti is the first to acknowledge there is a lot of work yet to do. It's part of the reason he issued that National Terrorism Advisory Bulletin warning about potential anti-Semitic attacks here in the United States by domestic terrorists. Jews are not alone uh, in being covered by that alert other religious ethnic minorities in the LGBTQ plus community uh, were also singled out as potential targets. Secretary Mayorkas knows all too well about the threat of anti-Semitism in the United States. He acknowledges it is a threat that is only getting worse, and it's one that's central to his work, he tells me, at the Department of Homeland Security. Gotti? Jacob, thank you. The University of Idaho is honoring the four students who were killed last month, but as family and friends continue to grieve, investigators are still searching for answers. We're gonna bring you the latest updates on the case. But first, we turn to another community who knows all too well how difficult the grieving, grieving process is, Newtown, Connecticut. Before the break, a look at a special concert that's happening tonight ahead of the 10-year anniversary of the Sandy Hook school shooting. It's been almost a month now since Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Zana Kernoodle, and Ethan Chapin were found stabbed to death at a home near the University of Idaho. But so far, police say they have still not identified a suspect. Investigators say they spent hours of the weekend going through tips and looking for information regarding a 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra that was seen in the area when the students were killed and they might have critical information to share. Meanwhile, the community continues to do everything they can to remember those victims. Tonight at the university's winter commencement, they were honored with a moment of silence followed by a song. It was a ceremony that one of the victims was supposed to attend. Ethan Chapin, Zana Carnodal, Maddie Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves were taken from us far too soon by a senseless act of violence. They were bright lights on our campus and cherished members of our community. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from Moscow, Idaho. Uh, Aaron, police are really focusing on this Hyundai Elantra. Why is that? Yeah, that's right, Gotti. As you mentioned, it's a 2011 to 2013 white Hyundai Elantra that was seen in the vicinity of the house around the time of the attacks. They released stock image of the vehicle just some days ago. They raised it again today in today's update. Once again, pleading uh, to the public for help identifying who may have owned it today, providing a little bit more information, saying that they believe that 
someone inside of that vehicle may have seen something. I was talking to a police spokesperson a short while ago, and she said that this tip had been called in by multiple individuals here in Moscow, Idaho, which is why they're so interested in it. I asked her if they had the vehicle on surveillance footage, if they saw it on CCTV. She would not be drawn on that question. Authorities here are being very tight-lipped with the details of this investigation so far, Gotti. Aaron, I know that's led uh, some of the family members to be really upset with the pace of the investigation and what's being released by police. Uh, what are police saying in response? Yeah, some family members of some of the victims are extremely frustrated. Remember, tomorrow marks a month since these brutal murders took place, a month since four college students were stabbed in the middle of the night in the home behind me. And yet, to the public, it looks as though the police have made very little leeway in terms of this investigation. It's very frustrating, of course, to the family members. They're critical of this ongoing investigation. Speaking to a police spokesperson, she told me that she is liaising, liaising with family members, that they have liaison officers who are working with family members, trying to give them as much information as they can. That said, she said there is a lot that they are not making public at this time, because at this time, their priority is catching this killer and making sure there's a conviction and not compromising the integrity of the investigation and the process. Scotty. Aaron, thanks so much. Break. Some other headlines we're keeping an eye on tonight. Splashing down, NASA's Orion space capsule is back on Earth after its trip to the moon. Plus, the nominees are out, and you know there's always going to be some snubs. We're going to break down the Golden Globes nominations. At tonight's Inspiring America, we're going to introduce you to a photographer who is capturing beauty even as he loses his eyesight. That's all just ahead, so stay tuned. And now time for some of the headlines we're following tonight. WNBA star Brittany Griner is safely back in the U.S. and continues to recover at a medical center in Texas. A rep of her is sharing that Griner has been able to see her family and even play a little bit of basketball, dunking again for the first time in 10 months since returning from Russia. This, as members of the Biden administration met today with the family of another wrongfully detained American, Paul Whelan, a State Department spokesperson telling NBC News, quote, we have not forgotten him and we will continue to pursue every avenue for his release. The remains of American sports journalist Grant Wall are back in the United States awaiting autopsy after his sudden death in Qatar on Friday. The 49-year-old fell ill while reporting on the World Cup. According to the U.S. State Department, there are no signs of foul play. Investigators are looking into a pipeline break in Kansas that released nearly 600,000 gallons of crude oil. The incident becoming the largest breach of the Keystone Pipeline that they've ever seen. Crews have since contained the spill, but the affected sections of the pipeline remain closed. Opening statements kicked off today in the second trial involving Oath Keepers for their role in the January 6th attack. The four members of the far-right group were charged with several felonies in addition to seditious conspiracy charges. Today's trial comes two weeks after another jury convicted the Oath Keepers founder and Florida chapter leader of seditious conspiracy. And the Supreme Court agreeing today to hear another case on President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. This case involves two debt holders who claim the administration failed to follow the correct procedure in announcing the plan. Arguments for both cases will be heard in February. And after nearly four weeks in space, the Orion spacecraft splashed down yesterday into the Pacific Ocean. The trip was a crucial test for the Artemis mission before NASA puts humans back on the moon. NBC's Tom Costello has more. Yeah, what a spectacular splashdown we saw yesterday uh, off the coast of Baja, California, when Orion returned to Earth after this 25-day mission, coming in, by the way, at 25,000 miles per hour when it hit the outer atmosphere and then slowed to a very calm, very steady uh, 20 miles per hour when it finally parachuted down uh, into the waters. But critically, that heat shield underneath Orion uh, had to hold because this is a new technology coming in much faster and hotter than previous missions. In fact, the, the bottom of that spacecraft was 5,000 degrees, half the temperature of the sun. So they had to make sure that that new heat shield would, in fact, protect future crews. 
and it seems to have done its job perfectly. They want to do a full analysis on that. But now we are looking at the next Orion crews that will carry humans. We expect an astronaut mission orbiting the moon probably in late 24, so two years from now. And then in 25 or 26, we're talking about the first return mission for astronauts actually landing on the moon, the first time since Apollo landed. The last Apollo landing, by the way, was 50 years ago yesterday. So it will be 52 plus years since Apollo last landed on the moon when in fact humans do return to the moon. And NASA has been very clear that that crew will include a woman and a person of color, the first ever to land on the surface of the moon. As America returns to the moon with international partners, we need to add, especially the Europeans, and then setting the stage eventually for a, a new space station that will orbit the moon and then eventually, America and its partners want to go on to Mars, probably in the late 2030s. The bottom line is the first step towards getting there was hugely successful with the completion of Artemis and Orion now back on Earth. Back to you. Tom, with hands down, the best assignment in the solar system. Thanks so much, Tom. And electric vehicles are becoming more and more popular, some of it thanks to tax credits to buy them. The Inflation Reduction Act provides up to $7,500 to purchase an EV, but there is some fine print. NBC's Ann Thompson explains. <laughs> it feels like a dream, to be honest. This is a moment six months in the making. <laughs> oh! Oh, my oh, very God. nice. At last, Abigail Bilbrey and Scott Wilson get their electric vehicle. The steering wheel is heated. Oh, my God. Like other prospective buyers, this couple learned the journey from EV research to purchase is one of twists and turns. A season of high gas prices and a federal tax credit. Can you take me for a spin? Make EVs a rare sight on dealer lots. They didn't even have a car you could sit in. They they didn't. But this couple did their homework. I like making spreadsheets. He's so. really good at that. <laughs> they compared the cost of a gas-powered SUV versus the EV. At first, the EVs seemed more expensive, with demand driving price above sticker. But the cost of gas changed that. Basically, whatever numbers we put in that were reasonable for gas, it ended up being more expensive in the long run than the EV. An even bigger factor for them, the Inflation Reduction Act. I think if we didn't get the tax deductions, we might have had to get a, a gas car. The IRA provides a federal tax credit of up to $7,500 on a new clean vehicle, but with two big restrictions. The vehicles must have final assembly in North America, upsetting allies in Europe and Asia. And the credit is limited to the first 200,000 vehicles sold this year per manufacturer. The Nissan Leaf built in Tennessee met those criteria. What's your favorite feature in the car? <laughs> I like everything, honestly. I like the fact that it charges and doesn't use gas. The new year will bring changes. The cap on manufacturer sales goes, but now it's about batteries. To receive the full tax credit, 40% of the battery's critical minerals must come from the U.S. or its free trade partners. And 50% of the battery's components must be made in North America. Will any vehicles qualify? Yes, yes, for sure. Tesla, uh, Ford, and GM have all made statements that they believe that their vehicles will qualify for at least part of the credit. On top of that, there are income limits for buyers and price limits for vehicles. The point of the EV tax credits is to make EVs affordable to the mainstream middle class. With the federal tax credit and a state rebate for Massachusetts, Abigail and Scott got $10,000 off the cost of their EV, driving away feeling good about their budget and the planet. Ann Thompson, NBC News, Norwood, Massachusetts. Thanks, Ann. The Golden Globes are back after a one-year hiatus. Nominations were announced today, and it marks the beginning of what organizers hope is a successful return to television. Dark comedy The Banshees of Inishirin scored eight nominations, the most by any motion picture. Everything Everywhere All at Once got six. Abbott Elementary had five nominations overall. That's the most by a television series or program. Then bringing in four nominations each are The Crown, Dahmer Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story, Pam and Tommy, The 
White Lotus and only murders in the building. The January 10th award ceremony will be back on NBC after the network decided not to broadcast last year's show. An investigation by the LA Times highlighted allegations of corruption and revealed that not one of the organization's then 87 members were black. The Hollywood Foreign Press Association has since added 21 new members, including six black members. And here to help break down some of this is Brian Balthazar, entertainment journalist and pop culture expert. Brian, welcome. First things first, a lot of criticism last year towards the, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association and still a lot this year. Do you think any of this year's nominations reflect a response to some of that criticism? Well, it's interesting because I think one of the most notable things is that not a single film with a, a, a black focused theme uh, really got a Best Picture nomination. We had options of uh, Wakanda Forever, The Woman King, Black Panther, uh, Till, and yet none of those received Best Motion Picture nominations. So I think that's kind of a shocker. But when we look at the numbers, we look at the, the breakdown of the people of color in the Hollywood foreign press, it's still, to me, a little bit lacking. We went from zero, a 96-member organization now has six black members, black members up from zero, and then they added 103 non-member voters, and a dozen or so of those are black. But I, I think those numbers are kind of low, considering that this is an awards program that is on warning. So while we did have a successful uh, TV show like Abbott Elementary uh, kind of you know, get five nominations. We should all be very happy for that. I still think there's still a little something lacking. Now, I'm pleased to see that we have Jared Carmichael hosting, uh, a young black man who's hilarious and, and a showrunner by the name of Jesse Collins, also a man of color who's going to be leading this program and promises that this is going to be a unique take and really fun. And uh, But I think there's still room for growth here. And speaking of that, Brendan Fraser, we, we saw him nominated for Best Actor, despite saying that he's going to skip out, right? So there's the snubs, and then there's those who may snub uh, the Golden Globes. What are other nominees saying right now? Right. So, well, interestingly, you know, we also had well, Brendan Fraser, who could still be nominated. Obviously, he was nominated, and he had always said that he wasn't going to go. He said his mother told him, taught him a lot, and one thing was not to be a hypocrite. And then we have a case of, like, Tom Cruise, who, uh, you know, Mission Impossible, the, the sequel, ha has been an enormous success, credited with bringing people back to theaters. He did, did not get a nomination, but what's interesting is he actually handed back. He returned all of his mm -hmm. Golden Glo Globe awards in the height of this scandal. So I don't think it's that surprising, given that we know that he's actually already returned his. So I'm sure that probably played a role in that. Um, you know, there's always surprises and snubs in these things. And, and we always have to wonder, particularly with the Hollywood foreign press, what has informed their voting choices. And Tom Cruise typically is always a big fan favorite. But then we also have Will Smith, who um, did not get a nomination for Emancipation. And frankly, you know, it's hard to know whether the Oscar backlash from last year played a role in that. This was a film that people really thought was going to be poised for award season. Now, in the past, the Golden Globes were kind of thought of as the barometer for what was an awards contender. But I really do think now that is not the case. I don't think voters are going to be taking this show as seriously yet because it still is a show that's on warning. So much drama in that show, and the show hasn't even started. Is there anything uh, different planned for the broadcast? Well, Jared Carmichael and the showrunner Jesse Collins have said that they don't want to give too much away, but they say it's going to have a much more creative approach and feel much more like entertainment than just your run-of-the-mill award show. But they've been very tight-lipped about what that will mean. Last year, they had the show. It wasn't televised, and it's still, they should, it wasn't a show. It was just an awards presentation. And so I think, you know, NBC has said they're going to give this a shot and see how it goes and see how the Hollywood Foreign Press does. And I think it remains to be seen. You know, they're putting it so it doesn't go against football. So they want to make sure that the ratings are a little bit more of a success than they have been in the past because award shows in general are waning in popularity with the general audience. So I think they're going to have to go out of the box but also show that they've really changed. Brian, thanks so very much. Thank you. And you might not know his name, but maybe you've seen his work in some of the most famous magazines and newspapers in the world. He's dedicated his life to elevating other people's stories, and now he has one of his own that's inspiring America. Raheem Alice has more. Russell Frederick always has a camera in his hand. That's because he's a photographer focused on capturing images of his beloved Brooklyn, New York that most people don't see. Brooklyn is a bodega. 
Brooklyn is rice and peas. <laughs> Brooklyn is soul food. Beautiful images that frame the social and cultural diversity of the borough he calls home. These are images that will shift perspectives. Oh, look at yeah. this. Yes. A man teaching his son how to tie a tie for the first time. There's a tenderness here. Absolutely. Frederick picked up a camera 25 years ago. I didn't know the difference between an F-stop and a bus stop. But mesmerized, he basically taught himself how to use it. The camera is such a powerful tool. He's trained his lens on his neighbors and beyond. His work featured in Ebony Magazine and the Washington Post. But recently, he faced a serious setback. Yes. You got some devastating health news. How did it strike you? <sighs> You can't make me cry on camera, man. Oh, man. I thought my life was over. Advanced glaucoma left him blind in one eye and vision fading in the other. First despair, then it was back to work. Lost my sight, but not my vision. Now, using digital technology to sharpen his images as he continues work on his book about Brooklyn and turns to directing and producing. Do you mind if I took your photograph? Moving a little slower. Hold that right there. But still with a sensitive eye to tell stories of the world as he sees it. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, New York. Thanks, Rahima. People in California are going to extreme measures just to get a roof over their heads. The housing crisis is so bad here in Los Angeles that some people are moving into state-owned homes that are not theirs. We're going to share their stories when we come back. I, Karen Ruth Bass. I, Karen Ruth Bass. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the State of California. And the Charter of the City of Los Angeles. And the Charter of the City of Los Angeles. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of mayor of the office of mayor according to my best ability according to my best ability madam mayor <laughs> vice president kamala harris doing the honors last night swearing in karen bass as the first woman to serve as mayor of los angeles and today the mayor is getting to work officially declaring a state of emergency on homelessness as her first act in office but she'll have her work cut out for her. In this city, you need three times the minimum wage just to be able to pay the average monthly rent. Meanwhile, rows and rows of homes in one area are publicly owned but sit empty until one group decided to start taking drastic measures and moving some people in. Take a look. For the past two years, I have a bunch of plants everywhere, <laughs> paintings there. Marta Escudero has worked to make this L.A. area house a home. This mess is all donations for unhoused community. But the house isn't hers. She and her two daughters moved into the El Sereno property in March 2020. No mortgage, no rental agreement, and no permission. This is like extreme measures because we are in extreme urgent times. The housing crisis is at its boiling point and it's popping right now. Activists who call themselves reclaimers broke into the empty state-owned home at night and moved Marta and her daughters in. They are just a few of the 40,000 people in L.A. with nowhere else to go. I was unhoused for over a year and a half. The rent was really high and I was unable to get a job. We really need to do something about it. These houses were among about 700 homes that the state transportation agency Caltrans purchased to make way for a freeway extension that was never built. In October of 2020, after months of negotiations, Caltrans worked with the city's housing authority to issue two-year leases to some of the group, including Marta. But now those leases are expired. Marta and her two daughters could be kicked out any minute. You're like, finally, ooh, I have a house and breathe and, and establish yourself. And then you know, the minute you move in, like, you need to get out, you need to get out. California State Senator Marielena Durazo, who represents the area, says there was a plan in place to get these houses to low-income people in El Sereno, and organized groups disrupted it. It has interrupted the process that we were going towards in order to have affordable 
housing and to be able to sell back to the community. The average monthly rent in L.A. County is $2,300. To pay that, renters would need to earn more than $45 an hour, three times the city's minimum wage. And it's not just in L.A. Organized groups took over homes in Oakland back in 2019 and tried to move into even more El Sereno homes later in 2020, resulting in a confrontation with police. That ended with more than 60 people under arrest. The Housing Authority in Los Angeles says it's going to do everything that it can to help Marta transition into other housing options. What happens to these houses is up to Caltrans, who says it's planning to sell an initial 37 houses to organizations that provide low-income housing. As for Marta and her family, their future is still unknown. I have a college degree. I was born and raised here, and this is stressful, but so is living a life that's not sustainable. And across the country, police are on high alert over stolen vehicles. The number of car thefts is way up this year, hitting the highest level in more than a decade. NBC's Vicki Wynn spoke with an expert on how you can better protect your ride. Caught on camera, a joy ride in a stolen car in Milwaukee. These criminals in Chicago stealing 10 luxury cars right from a dealership. In Washington, D.C., this suspect captured right on the car's dash cam. He's not and in Glendale, Wisconsin, thieves lead police on a dangerous chase through the streets off-road. Lost the tire. Finally coming to an end. Crash, crash, crash. Scenes like these playing out coast to coast with thieves even taking cars right from driveways. Already in 2022, 745,000 cars stolen, with experts predicting this year we'll see the most car thefts in 14 years. Since 2008, we have not seen numbers like this. We are going to approach 1.1 million cars stolen, and that's a 24% increase during the COVID-19 pandemic. David Galawi is the president and CEO of the National Insurance Crime Bureau. He says last year, Bakersfield, California, Denver, Colorado, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Portland, Oregon had the highest rates of car thefts, with Kia and Hyundai the most popular cars targeted by thieves. The price of used cars and car parts are up astronomically. Used cars are up almost 40%. The value is what's driving the criminal enterprises. They're worth a lot of money. To learn how to make it harder for thieves to steal your car, I team up with Mike Zapraconi, former NYPD detective and now president of Squad Security. So, Mike, here's the thing. How are these thieves making off with so many people's cars these days? You know, Vicky, it's because we're lazy. Mm -hmm. We leave the key inside. We leave the fob inside. Always take it with you, even okay. if it's for a second. You have to run back in the house. Remember, let's not make it easy for them. Take the key, lock your door. Police warn luxury cars with folding mirrors are especially vulnerable. When the mirrors are open like this, it usually means the car is open and your key fob might be inside the key car. Oh. So by closing them, uh -huh. what you're doing is you're telling the bad guys, this car's locked and there's no fob in there. And they're going to just walk away and go to another car, an easier target. If you have a garage, put your car, not your stuff, in it. You plunge your garage, what's the first thing you should do? Close the door. Close the door, wait till you hear the girl go down, mm -hmm. and you see the door down. Then you can turn off your car and exit your vehicle. Why do you want your garage door to be closed before you get out? So nobody can run in behind you, okay? And then, then all of a sudden, if someone gets in behind you, now they have a shot of taking your car, taking your phone, taking everything, possibly even burglarizing your house. What's your advice for the code when it comes to your garage keypad? Be creative. Don't use one, two, three, four, zero, 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 zero. Don't use your address. Come up with something new and different. As for parking in the driveway? I like to pull in those first. Okay. Every second counts. It takes longer to back it out than to pull out. What about these GPS tags? Tile makes one, Apple makes one, Samsung too. Do you think you should put one of these in the car? I think it's a great idea. Any advantage we can. But always keep in mind, the police know how to do their job. Let them track these, not you personally. And hide the tracker where a thief won't look. Security cameras can be a good way to keep your property safe, so consider installing one and park your car in its field of view. What if your only option is to park your car on the street? Well, you want to park as close as you can to the other vehicle. Mm -hmm. You want to turn your wheels to the curb, so it makes it more difficult for them to tow your car away. Thieves are actually towing people's cars no, away? Without a doubt. Of course they are. Get this. Thieves can even strike while you're driving. It's called a, a bump and rob. Okay, where someone's going to come up in front of you, stage a fake accident, hmm. you're going to run into them, and then someone may come up behind you. But the whole purpose is to get you out of the car so someone could jump in and take your car. They'll steal your car when in you get In a second, out. that's right. So you, you need to know, don't ever get out of the car. Okay. Make sure your doors are locked, call 911, 
Okay, wait for the police to come. Wow, thanks, Vicky. And if you haven't started your holiday shopping yet, it is not too late. And guess what else? You can actually give more sustainable gifts this year. We've got some tips on how you can be more eco-friendly, even if you are a procrastinator. When NBC News Now Tonight continues. And with climate change making headlines, sustainability is increasingly on people's minds. And as the holidays approach, people are looking for different ways they can buy gifts while also protecting the environment. In a Hallie Jackson Now original, NBC's Dasha Burns shares some tips on how to make gift giving more sustainable. Less than two weeks until Christmas and holiday shopping is in full swing. The National Retail Federation predicts holiday sales will grow between 6% and 8% over last year, totaling around $950 billion this year. And 83% of customers will seek sustainable products and shipping this holiday season, according to research by Salesforce. The consumer has a certain expectation now of what they want from the companies they're buying from. And so the retailers, one, want to be part of the solution. And there's more emphasis on what do you stand for? What are you doing about climate change? So what makes a gift eco-friendly? I consider a gift to be eco-friendly if, if the materials that are used in the product are as sustainable as possible. Then at the end of the product's useful life, there is a way to dispose of it or to for it to biodegrade or for it to be recycled. Here are five tips Preston, founder of Mindful Mama, says can make your gifting more sustainable. One, focus on quality over quantity. So focus on buying one really nice gift instead of a whole bunch of cheaper gifts, so something that will last. Two, look for products made from sustainable materials. So you can find wood toys, you can find um, soft um, cloth dolls or other types of toys as opposed to plastics. She says you can also find plastic toys that are made from recycled materials. Companies like Green Toys make their products from recycled milk jugs and plastic bottles. Three, give experiences instead of stuff. For young kids, that could mean a membership to a science or children's museum. For older kids, think movie gift cards and activity adventures that are available where they live. And for adults, maybe concert tickets or a cooking class. Tip number four, shop local. When you shop local, you're, um, there's not as much in incurred in the way of shipping. You're also supporting a local business or a local artisan. At this time of year, there's often a lot of craft fairs around, so you can find really nice children's toys or gifts that are made by local artisans. And five, gift reusable items, things that replace disposable products. Think reusable containers, water bottles, and straws. The user uses them over and over again, and maybe they'll think of you as they use that gift. So the gift, it kind of keeps on giving over time. Also, when it comes to wrapping paper, don't buy it. Use old newspaper or other paper you may already have in your house to cut down on additional wrapping paper waste. Thanks, Dasha. And before we go, the headlines are not always bleak, but you might not know it from watching the news. So we're going to give you your 60 seconds of joy. And today we start with Bob Barker, the former host of The Price is Right, because he's celebrating his 99th birthday. His team says he's going to spend it quietly watching his favorite TV shows. Happy birthday, Bob. And in New Orleans, Santas and others decked out in their holiday best got together on Saturday to go drinking. But for a cause, it is a city holiday tradition known as the running of the Santas. Santas running from the South Pole to the North Pole, a.k.a. two bars a few blocks away from each other. It's the most wonderful time of the year, I guess. Uh, some of the proceeds going to a foundation that supports surviving families of fallen Air Force service members. And over 100 kids in San Sarasota, Florida, got to shop for holiday presents with police. The city's housing authority paired 150 kids with cops at Target, all of it starting about eight, 11 years ago as a way to help bridge the gap between those who live in public housing and police. And that does it for now tonight. Thank you so much for ending your day with us. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and the news continues right now. 
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.